Here are three words, three different words. Each one spelled differently, but are they pronounced differently? And are they pronounced with the same differences everywhere? Well, listen. Mary, Mary, Mary. 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 And I would say, Mary, Mary, Mary. Six people, and none of us says these three words in exactly the same way. In just a moment, we're going to answer the question, who's right and who's wrong? Here is Miss Gowaltney. Now, Miss Gowaltney comes from Smithfield, Virginia. And next to her is Miss Winness. Miss Winness comes from Green Bay, Wisconsin. That's right. Next to her, Mr. John Kepke from that wonderful city, Brooklyn, New York. Next to him, Miss Buchan from North Andover, Massachusetts. And next to her, Miss Blair from Dallas, Texas. Take a look now at those first three words that they said for us. I'm going to ask them each one now to say them again. Starting with Miss Gowaltney, will you say these three words again, please? Mary, Mary, Mary. Now notice Miss Gowaltney pronounces those three words differently. They are not all the same. Again, please. Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary. Now, Miss Witness, please. Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary. All three the same. Mr. Kepke. Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary. All three different. Miss Bouquet? Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary. All three different again. Miss Blair, please. Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary, Mary, Mary. All the same again. And again, I say, Mary, 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 all three differently. Now, what does this mean? Here's what it means. We have learned to spell these three words in regular ways. And if we don't spell our language correctly, we are called illiterate. In other words, the written language has become very uniform in terms of what we call spelling. But people who talk are not uniform in the same way. Now, because we've all learned to pronounce these words in various ways, no, let's put it around the other way. Because we've all learned to spell these words the same way, we get the idea we ought to pronounce them the same way, one right way. This is just not true. We are going to pronounce them differently, but we must learn to spell them the same way. Please remember, letters do not have sounds. We do not pronounce letters. These are simply symbolic representations for what we say in the language. And how our differences pattern is what we're going to show you on this program. Now, how can we tie up these differences, which we've already noticed, with what we call dialect areas? Well, I'm going to show you. The first thing I'm going to do, again, is to start with Miss Gowalfing. And I'm going to ask her if she will... No, I don't think I'll do it that way. The first thing I'm going to do is to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. If you pronounce these three words, Mary, 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 differently, you will have learned your English east of the Allegheny Mountains. Those who pronounce those words differently learn their English east of the Allegheny Mountains. If you pronounce those words the same, you learned your English west of the Allegheny Mountains. Just remember that. Now, I'm going to come back again. And I'm going to talk about this word, spelled G-R-E-A-S-Y. Now, I am going to make two predictions. I am going to predict what Miss Gowaltney is going to say here and what Miss Windness is going to say here, because we know where they're from. Remember, Miss Gowaltney comes from Smithfield, Virginia. Miss Windness from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Now, our problem is this. And Miss Winness, and neither Miss Winness nor Miss Gawaltney can see this card that I have here. What I'm going to do is this. I am going to predict that Miss Gawaltney is going to pronounce, that is going to say a sound that is represented there by that letter. This is what she is going to say. She is going to pronounce that sound in that word. Miss Gawaltney, will you say this for me? It's greasy. It's greasy. It's greasy with that particular sound. Now, Miss Witness, will you pronounce it for me? Miss Witness now is going to say, 
the other one. She is going to say this. This witness? It's greasy. It's greasy with this sound. All right. In other words, we have established something here by saying, in effect, if you learned your English north of a certain line, you are going to say greasy for this word. If south of a certain line, breezy. Now, let's see where that line runs. Actually, the line runs right along here, the parallel 40 degrees, right across here. And this particular parallel 40, right over here, runs right along with the Lincoln Highway, which is Route 30, I believe, dividing this part of the country into two neat halves. In other words, we have now a dividing line down the Allegheny Mountains for east and west, and another for north and south. In other words, we begin to get a pattern which emerges in terms of our areas. Here is the first large quarter of the country up here, east of the mountains and west of, I mean, and north of this line. Here is number two, south of it, number three, and number four. We've divided the country now then into four great areas, although it might look unbalanced geographically in terms of population, it's a pretty good division. Now let's see if this particular greasy, greasy line does work as we predict. I am now going to come back to Mr. Kepke. I'm going to skip him and go to Miss Buchan and ask her what she says for this. And you'll see why I'm skipping Mr. Kepke in just a minute. Greasy. 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 North, again. Miss Blair? Greasy. Greasy. Another, again, from Dallas, Texas, Miss Blair gives us a zuh sound. So far, everything is fine. Now I'm going to come back to Mr. Kepke. Remember, Mr. Kepke's from Brooklyn, and ask him what he says. I say greasy. Now, Mr. Kepke says greasy. Now, is our prediction wrong? Is our, or our observations wrong? No. Because in the area around Manhattan, people past a certain age, what I mean by this is people in a certain generation, are going to say greasy and not greasy. Mr. Kepke uh, happens to be in that particular generation bracket that says greasy rather than greasy. Uh, the school kids at the present time will say very definitely greasy now. But in his generation, it was greasy. These kinds of, if you will, observations of correlation we can make, and we find we can get so we can predict pretty well what kinds of things we can expect in terms of what parts of the country. Now let me, uh, well, let me go on for just a second. Let me do it this way. I want to tell you that there's another way of doing dialects than just by vowels, which is what we are working on, except for this one constant. But most of the things we're going to be doing here is by is by vowels. But there is another way that we talk about dialects, and that is what vocabulary items are used. Now, as a matter of fact, most of the dialect work that has been done to date has been done on vocabulary, on words. You know you've all had the experience of, of, of hearing something that's very familiar to you called something quite different in another part of the country. I remember that when I first went to Boston, I was very surprised to hear what they call, what I call, soda pop. I wonder if Miss Buchan has a different kind of way of calling soda pop than I had, and if it's the one that I remember. Ms. Buchan, what do you call it? We call it tonic. They call it tonic. Now, that was something <laughs> that my mother used to give me in the springtime. But you see, tonic is a perfectly ordinary word for soda pop in the area around Boston. Therefore, we, would let, we, we don't get too surprised about this kind of thing. That is, that different words are going to be used. In fact, I'm going to ask the panel now for a few other ones. I'm going to start now with Ms. Uh, Gwaltney and ask her, one minute, just a second. I'm going to, you know what I'm going to ask you, Nick, not soda pop. I want to ask you, I want you all to know that I have not talked to these good people before the program, so I'm going to be maybe as surprised at some of the things that come out as you will. Ms. Gwaltney, um, when you're referring to more than one person in a, in a group, uh, how do you refer to them? Um, y'all. Yeah, y'all. Yeah. Hi, y'all, <laughs> like that. Miss Witness, uh, would you use that particular way of referring to people? No. What do you say? You. You, just like that. You. Mr. Kepke? You. You. Ms. Buchan? You. You. Ms. Blair? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, there seems to be obviously, a, which I think doesn't surprise anybody, a northern and southern division here in terms of whether you use y'all or not. I'm also a y'all speaker. I'm also a greasy speaker. You see, so again, these particular kinds of things are patterning out. Now, I'm going to ask some other questions. Again, I want to start with Ms. Gwaltney and ask her whether she has, um, hmm, what do you call the little animal that's out in the woods that's black and has a white stripe down its back and a sort of bushy tail and at times emits a very unpleasant odor? Skunk. You say skunk. Yeah. 
Now, may I go to Miss Blair and ask her what she says for that? I say skunk. You say skunk, too. And how about the rest of our panel starting this witness? Skunk. 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 Do any of the panel say polecat? I see heads shaking. Nobody says polecat? That's very interesting because I'm a polecat speaker myself, though, of course, I've heard people say skunk. Well, let's ask a few more. How about uh, Miss Gowaltney again? Miss Gowaltney again from Smithfield, Virginia. You have eaten cornbread all your life, haven't you? Uh, no, not, not really. You've I'm heard the term. Oh, oh, yes. Do you make a distinction between cornbread and ordinary kind of bread? Rolls and... No, not rolls, just plain ordinary bread. What do you call ordinary bread? Just plain bread? Just bread. Just bread. bread. So do I. Have you ever heard people that say light bread? I, I might have heard it, but... You might, I might have too, but I don't, I don't use it very much either. No. Now, Miss Blair, may I ask you, what do you say for that? Miss Blair from Dallas. Well, I would say cornbread. I'd make the distinction. Cornbread and what other kind of bread? Just bread. Just plain bread, all right. Now, I'm going to go back to Miss Gowalton again and ask her, do you ever, have you ever heard, uh, what do you call, do you say corn shucks or corn husks? Corn husk. You say corn husks and not corn shucks, Miss Blair? Corn husk. All right, rest of the panel, what do you say, starting this witness? What do you say? Corn husk. You just say husk. All right, so. now, I'm going to show you a map, which has been made up in terms of certain observations in regard to vocabulary. Here is the U-all line, right here. That's the U-all line. In other words, south of this, you have U-all speakers, and north of this line, and you see where this is going, very close to the Mason-Dixon line, you have U speakers. Now, these other lines here are for the, this one, the dotted line here, is for corn shucks, which I have said all my life, but I have not made the light bread distinction, which goes very close, as you can see, to the U-all line, and the polecat one, the skunk one, is not on here, incidentally, but it's right about here. And I've been a polecat speaker all my life. Now, one of the reasons, actually, why I personally feel that vocabulary items are not as accurate in terms of getting dialect boundaries is just the kind of thing that we've heard here this afternoon. That is that standard speakers of English are generally more inclined to use words that are uniform. In other words, polecat speakers have, so to speak, become skunk speakers. In other words, I would never write polecat. I would always write skunk if I were writing even a letter. But polecat is the word that I heard. And so you see, in, in the case of my own particular usage, some of this business agrees, but some doesn't. But now again, what we've been interested in, and what we are interested in, is this business of the vowels, particularly, which I think is a better indication of dialect differentiation than the words. So let's return now to our vowels and see if we can have a few more here. Uh, let me ask, uh, starting again with Miss Gowaltney, please. What do you say for this one, number three? Put it on. Put it on. Put it on. Miss Witness? Put it on. Put it on. Miss Kepke? Put it on. Put it on. Miss Buchan? Put it on. Put it on. Miss Blair? Put it on. Put it on. All right, now I say put it on. Just like that, put it on. Mr. Kepke again, please. Put it on. Miss Witness again, please. Put it on. Put it on. Miss Witness's on and my on are pretty good examples of the northern and southern contrast. Remember, I come from Baltimore. I'm a greasy speaker and an on speaker and a merry, merry, merry speaker. Again, patterning is beginning to emerge. Now what I'd like to do is to go right away to Mr. Kepke and ask him if he will read me these lines here in number four. Off, dog, often, lot, Log, sorry. Please notice that what Mr. Kepke did was to say off dog often with all vowels and lot log sorry with ah vowels. This is typical of the Central Atlantic seaboard. I say the same thing. Listen to me. Off dog often, lot log sorry. Now, just so far, we've begun to see that patterning begins to emerge. Now, tell one thing that people always ask, why should we have these dialect differences? Well, the best thing that I can say is that we have dialect differences because of two major reasons. In other words, they're correlated. That's generally cause and effect so much as there is correlation. One with the settlement history of an area and the other in terms of geographical boundaries. Now, for instance, here in the United States, this is a map now of the United States divided into eight major dialect areas. I could have divided into 88 or 108 for that matter, but I've selected eight. 
Now, the areas that we have here, coastal New England, already represented by the Massachusetts speaker, Ms. Buchan. We have Mr. Kepke, a northern Central Atlantic sea seaboard speaker, and I am a southern Central Atlantic seaboard speaker. We have a coastal New England speaker, area number four, Miss Gwaltney from Smithfield, Virginia. And as we are going to see, we have in the case of Miss Blair from Dallas, a speaker right on the line here that shows between four and six. So to go again, we have coastal New England, western New England number two, Central Atlantic seaboard three, four here, coastal, southern, five, the upland area, six, southern middle west, seven, northern middle west, where Miss Witness comes from, from Green Bay, and eight, the far west. Now, as you can see, and it's very simple really to see, there is a correlation in terms of the settlement of the country and the geographical areas. When the first settlers came, they stopped pretty well at the mountains. It wasn't until uh, about 1785, after the revolution really, that people began going into this area. And this area, of course, is the most recently settled and has the fewest number of people. So obviously we wouldn't expect to get so many dialect areas there as we do here. Now, in terms then of these areas, let's see if we can come back now and get the kinds of patternings that will be typical of these particular dialect areas. And in this case, I would like to start with Ms. Buchan. Ms. Buchan, will you, you've already read me here, these three, will you read them rapidly for me again? Mary, Mary, Mary. All right, Mary, Mary, Mary places her again east of the Alleghenies. It's greasy. Puts her north? On. On. Now, her on is the kind I would expect north of Boston. On would be the most usual Boston pronunciation, but north of Boston, where I believe North Andover is, we yes. get on perfectly expected. Now, will you read these? Off, dog, often, lot, log, sorry. Please notice, Miss Buchan says lot, not lot, as Mr. Kepke and I did, for instance. Hear that? Lot. That's our ninth vowel in that chart, the one that's down in the back, the low back rounded vowel, typical of New England. Now, will you give me number six, please, Miss Buchan? Father, park, pot. Father, park, pot. In other words, a typical, what people call generally flat A. What this is, is the digraph and the H in terms of our chart that we had on the board first. Now, I want to move immediately now to Mr. Kepke and ask him what he would do with number seven and eight. Yes, I can. I want it in a can. <laughs> Please notice that Mr. Kepke makes a distinction. Yes, I can. I want it in a can between seven and eight. Ms. Buchan, return to you. What do you do for these? Yes, I can. I want it in a can. Yes, I can. I want it in a can. No difference. Now, the difference between the can and can distinction. Miss Witness, can you hear this one? Huh? I hear it, but I don't say it. I know you don't say it, because after all, you coming from Green Bay couldn't. But I'm just wondering if you heard it, because yeah. quite frequently people from northern and west can't even hear this distinction. I'll say it again. I can, I want it in a can. This particular change is, I mean, this particular distinction is the one that is shown right here that circles the area known as the Central Atlantic Seaboard. All Central Atlantic Seaboard speakers <coughs> will make that distinction. It goes down quite far into the south, too. I'm now going to ask Miss Waltney if she makes a distinction between can and can. Yes, I can. Put it in a can. Again, please. Yes, I can. Put it in a can. Yes, I can. Put it in a can. No, I don't hear a distinction there. In other words, you are outside of this particular influence. In other words, we can draw a pretty firm line just on these two alone. And again, draw the difference between Brooklyn and New England again. Very strongly in terms of this. Now, I'd like to go to Miss Blair, if I might. Miss Blair, you pronounced these all the same, didn't you? Yes. Mary, again. Mary, Mary. All right. And this one was Greasy. That's right. And this one was? On. Um, all right. Now, will you give me, please, number 12? Any, many, penny. Now, any, many, penny. This pronunciation, instead of any, many, penny, school teachers in the South have been trying to get out of the speech of Southern speakers, standard Southern speakers, for a great many years, and I hope they never do. This is a very ancient and honorable pronunciation of these kinds of words and will, I hope, continue. No matter what the school teachers do, standard speakers are still going to say any, many, penny because it's part of the pattern for that area. Now, this is then very typical of the Southern Middle West. And again, I want to ask Miss uh, Blair if she'll pronounce this word for me. Ash. Ash. And this one? Ash. Ash. Ash is diphthongal. Ash. Not ash. Mr. Kepke, will you tell me how you pronounce that? Ash. Mr. Kepke says ash. Miss Windness, please. Ash. Ash. I say ash, but Miss Blair says ash. Ash. When you hear that particular pronunciation, 
It is typical of this whole area number six, this diphthongal pronunciation. In other words, Miss Blair is very typical in being Southern Middle Western with her any mini penny and with her ash. Now, to return again to a typical pronunciation, one that is as unequivocal as the ash or the can-can one, let me go back to Miss Gawaltney. Miss Gawaltney, what will you do for number 10 here? About the house. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Say it again, will you? About the house. About the house. Please notice, she is not saying about the house. People say, all those people from around North and so on, they all say about the house, and so do the Canadians, they all say about the house. They don't. I'll ask her to say it again. Miss Gawaltney, please. About the house. About the house. This is, in terms of the chart we had on the board first, an EW, complex nucleus, instead of an A, ah, an AW1. I say about the house now, but I used to say about the house. But Miss Gawaltney says about the house. This is very typical of the tidewater area of the coastal area of Virginia. Now, let me return now, please, to Miss Windness and get the typical kind of pronunciation we hear for Northern Middle West. Remember, Miss Windness comes from, from South Bay, Wisconsin, for number four. Off, dog, often, lot, log, sorry. Will you read me number five right away, too? Wash, water, ash, ask. This word is? Water. Water. Uh, Mr. Kepke, what is this word in your pronunciation? Water. Water. Please notice, the eastern speaker says water, but the western speaker says? Water. Water. Now, Miss Blair, what do you say for this? Water. She says water. But Miss Gwaltney, what do you say? Water. She says water. In other words, our eastern speaker and our southern speaker right on the transition line between southern coastal and Dallas both say water. But our northern middle western speaker gives us a good water and our Central Atlantic Seaboard speaker gives us water. And I say water, exactly. Again, you would expect my pattern to be like Central Atlantic Seaboard, but it's Southern. I say greasy instead of greasy. All right, uh, Miss Windness, again. Uh, will you give me these words? Father, park, part. Please notice the amount of the R that we hear here. Father, park, part. Say it again, please. Father, park, part. Father, park, part. A good stout retraction of the tongue, sort of curled back when you say park and park. Now, may I return now to Miss Buchan and ask her again to say these words? Father, park, part. Father, park, part, where we hear no retraction. Mr. Kepke, please. Father, and then I have two pronunciations for park and part, either that way or park, part. I like both of them, Mr. Kepke, because they illustrate what I'm after in this case, namely, very little, if any, are coloring, you see. In other words, our Eastern speakers obviously have a good deal of R, I mean, a, a practically no R, our New England and Brooklyn speaker, in contrast to our Northern Middle Western speaker. Now, again, Miss Blair, will you give me these? Father, park, park. Again? Father, park, park. Father, park, park. In other words, you've got about a half retraction. In other words, your R is about half pronounced in contrast to Miss Buchanan and Mr. Kepke's and certainly only half pronounced in contrast to Miss Witness, right? Yes, sir. Okay. In other words, then, <clears throat> Miss Blair, again, seeing on our map, is in a transitional area. That is, she has many coastal southern similarities, I mean, uh, pronunciations, but she also has the several of the kinds of things, including this ash that we noticed was uh, here in the southern part of the Middle West. Now, for just a moment, I'm going to run down my speech and see whether or not this patterning makes sense as far as I'm concerned. Mary, Mary, Mary. All three said differently, east of the mountains. It's greasy, south of the parallel forty. Put it on. Again, goes as a southern pronunciation with greasy. Off dog often, la, la, sorry. In other words, the same kind of rounding and unrounding that you noticed in Mr. Kepke, the northern Central Atlantic seaboard speaker. Wash water. I'm a water speaker, not a water speaker. Ash S. The same kind of distinction <coughs> in ash s as I have down here in can and can. Exactly what we would expect there. And that these, being a Central Atlantic Seaboard speaker, these would be in contrast. Father, park, park, not very much R. Uh, over here, about the house was my original pronunciation. And I'll say about the house, but I used to say about the house. And again, this one, any, many, penny, not any, many, penny, because I'm a coastal speaker. What we have shown then, 
And what these good people have been so kind as to help us demonstrate is this. Standard speakers of American English and standard speakers of English anywhere are going to have a different selection of the inventory, the possible vowel sounds, which will appear in the same word. Again, the same word in quotation marks. Words spelled the same way. Do not think because the spelling is different that the words must be pronounced differently. As we've seen, the spelling is the only thing that we have actually standardized. That's part of the written language. Now, this particular business, then, this whole matter of dialect difference, all standard speakers are right. What we're going to do next week is to actually study patterning from another angle, the patterning of the words and how those words fit into grammar. Grammar next week. The patterning of words. Be with us then, won't you?